Grand Gardens. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus, who is present in this sanctuary, in and through and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calls us to worship, so will you join with me in the call to worship that you'll see on the screens and also in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Amen, and thanks be to God. This is the season of Advent, these four Sundays that immediately precede Christmas. It's an opportunity for us here in the Christian church to prepare ourselves, our hearts, our lives, our minds, to embody different practices that help us get ready to celebrate Christ's birth, to celebrate Christ's coming. So Advent, despite what the commercials and the retailers tell us, is actually a season to slow down and to wind down and to be contemplative and restful and thoughtful. It's certainly a time to be generous, and it's an opportunity to practice Christ's presence and to be present in friendship and community with one another. And so I would invite all of us to practice a contemplative and slower Advent season this year so that when we get to Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, as we're surrounded by family and by friends, we would also have spent time preparing ourselves to more fully receive the gift of Christ with us, of God with us, and of Christ's coming. So as we, over these next four weeks as a congregation, practice and celebrate Advent, we mark time. And we mark time by the lighting of Advent candles, and we mark that time through an Advent responsorial reading and, and ceremony. And each week over the next month, we will have different folks from the congregation who will lead us in this Advent practice of marking time and of preparing our hearts through the readings of Scripture and through the lighting of candles. And so this morning, I am really excited to have Beth and Diane Jones to come up here and to join me as they will lead us in our responsorial reading and the lighting of the Advent wreath and candles. Let's see if it lights. Who gets to play with fire? There you go. <laughs> Just light one of the purple candles. Thank you. Good morning. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. As the Lord has promised in days to come, the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Let us pray. Holy God, banish the darkness as we light this candle. We welcome this light among us to be a sign of the awe and wonder that dawns in your coming to us. God, who fulfills the promise, set us aflame with hope. We wait in hope with all your people through the ages and into tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. I would now like to invite Mark Lips to come forward. He has some information to share with you about our uh, Christmas partnership with the Reach Shelter and the Angel Tree that you'll see in the back of the sanctuary. Good morning. Good morning. Nice smiling faces this morning. <laughs> Reach is the largest emergency shelter for families with minor children experiencing homelessness in Palm Beach County. The program focuses on the immediate stabilization of families while working to fulfill a goal of obtaining permanent housing for the families at shelters. 
Gardens Presbyterian Church has a long-standing partnership with REACH. On a weekly basis, we collect non-perishable food, gently used clothing, household goods that Dick Woodrow delivers to the shelter. Our deacons would like to provide the current 22 families with a Christmas dinner, just like we did at Thanksgiving. They are collecting monetary donations in order to purchase dinner items needed for that meal. There's a basket at the sound booth to put your donations into. There are currently 58 children being housed at, the, at REACH. In the back of the sanctuary, we have an angel tree with gift tags listed for each child down at the shelter. If you'd like to purchase a gift, please take a tag off the tree and bring it back with a wrapped present with the gift tag attached. We certainly appreciate everyone's generosity and support for the REACH program. Thank you, Mark. I would just then invite you all to take a look at the bulletin at various points throughout the day or later this afternoon so you can familiarize yourself with what's going on in the coming weeks and in this month of December. Uh, but those are all the announcements that I have for you, so I would invite you now to stand and to greet one another, welcome each other to worship, and extend the peace of Christ towards one another. Our first scripture lesson from this morning comes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Hear now the word of the Lord. This is what Isaiah, Amos' son, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountains, the mountain of the Lord's house, will be the highest of all the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills. Peoples will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, come, let's go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Instruction will come from Zion. The Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. Our second scripture lesson for this morning comes from the New Testament epistle, Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. As you do all this, you know what time it is. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. Now our salvation is nearer than when we first had faith. The night is almost over and the day is near. So let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. Instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. This is the word of the Lord. Be Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, you who created us and redeem us and sustain us even now, we pause in this moment of silence and stillness to acknowledge your presence and your power in this place. Come, Lord Jesus. We consent to your divine presence and action within our lives. And I pray, Christ, that you would have mercy on me, a sinner. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So in Advent, we have a chance to hear from the prophets. Those preachers and pastors of old, both 
in the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures, people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and those in the New Testament, people like Paul, Peter, John even, whose calling, whose ministry was to speak to the people, to remind them of God's goodness, God's presence, God's power, God's action and activity in the midst of our lives, even when it would seem like God would not and is not present. And at the same time, to call the people of God, to call us as the people of God, into ways of renewed faithfulness, renewed worship. Prophets are always calling the people of God to recenter their lives on God's presence and power, and in so doing, to live accordingly. And so we, this morning, have had an opportunity to hear from Isaiah and from Paul. And these prophets have given us both a prophetic vision and a prophetic invitation. The prophetic vision is that of the vision of Zion, Mount Zion, the mountain of God. Throughout the scriptures, Zion has a robust meaning. It literally refers to either one of two scholars debate as to which mountain in the city of Jerusalem is actually the one to be referred to as the biblical Zion, but it refers to the mountainous and the elevated landscape within the city of Jerusalem itself. But it also has come to be synonymous with and to represent this image, this idea of Jerusalem being God's city, the place where the reign of God will be manifested on earth. It is an apocalyptic vision, a vision for God's coming good future. We talk a lot about the reign of God, about what it will look like and what it is that God hopes for and promises to one day do. This reign of God when all things will be done according to God's will and God's ways. It will be a place and it will be a life it will be a reign of love and of grace and of mercy, of peace, of wholeness. This idea is represented in this idea of Zion. And in the Hebrew scriptures, in our Old Testament, the promise that God made to the covenant people Israel was that one day there would come a time in which all of the enmity all of the violence, all of the hatred and all of the alienation and all of the fear that human beings feel towards one another that is most often played out in geopolitical crises and in international disputes and wars, that all of that enmity will one day be healed. It will be replaced and where there was once skepticism and fear and anger and aggression and rivalry between human beings, all of that will be replaced with shalom, with peace, with equity, with love, with justice, with a desire and an earnest hunger. That every created soul would receive blessing and goodness. One day, Isaiah tells us, Zion is coming. All human relationships will be healed. One day, Zion is coming, Isaiah tells us, in which all of the created Glory, all of humanity, 
all of the nations, all of the tribes, all of the different peoples, Israel and the nations, Jews and Gentiles, they will be united not only in loving care for one another in Zion, but they will be united in loving worship and adoration of God. There will be unity. There will be unification. There will be true worship of God. Of Yahweh God. On God's high and holy hill of Zion, that all the nations, all the tribes, all the sects, all the people of the world will come together in an embodiment of that Hebrew word shalom, experiencing true and right union and relationship with God and loving relationship with each other. The scriptures tell us that Zion is coming, that one day this great reality will be the case. This reality that the prophet uses to describe by using words, poetic words, saying things like swords will be beaten into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Instruments that were once used for war and for violence will be turned into, into instruments used of nurture and of tender care. That that day is coming. And it will come, the scriptures tell us, when the heir to the Davidic line, the king of all kings, the prince of peace, the Messiah, when that Messiah comes, then Zion will not be far off. The reign of God will be present in new and powerful ways. And we in the church recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as that Prince of Peace, as that long-awaited Messiah who has come to unite all nations, who has come to unite all tribes, to reveal in new and profound and unprecedented ways the face of God who is God in flesh and who has come to offer us healing from sin and union with God, the things that our heart longs for. It is a gift offered to all and to everyone. That Jesus Christ, Son of David, Son of God, comes to bring about Zion. But one of the things that the scriptures are clear about as well is that while this is also, to use that word we used early, earlier, an eschatological or an apocalyptic hope, this hope that is coming in the future, the scriptures are clear and they tell us that this is also a very real and a present hope for us. Advent is not just something that we wait for, something coming in the future, but it's something that we wait and prepare for to recognize the future that is already come and is among us and is around us. One of the things that was interesting in the prophet, uh, in Isaiah the prophet's writings, was not just this vision that he provides of Zion, but the way that he closes out that particular passage of scripture in verse 5. Right after he has said, nation will not take up sword against nation, they will no longer learn how to make war, he then says, the prophet then says, come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. That's interesting. He makes a shift. Do you catch that? He makes a shift from proclaiming a beautiful vision of God's coming future into a very present invitation. And then if we hop on down to what we read in Romans... And in particular, when we have a chance to read some of the things that Paul was writing, this thing about the night is almost over, the day is near. Instead, dress yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we see that there is this invitation that the prophets extend to us. The invitation to live into our calling to help be a part of God's ongoing work, of God's mission, of establishing Zion right here and right now. The reign of God is not something that is just coming in the future. Zion and the hope of all the nations being united in right, reconciled relationship with each other and with God is not just something coming in a mythical or hoped for future, but it's something that is happening right now. That reconciliation, that wholeness, that the healing of the brokenness that has defined humanity since sin entered in is being restored, redeemed, and healed even now. God is at work establishing Zion right now. God is at work transforming hearts and lives so that people will choose to see a weapon of war like a sword and to transform it into a plowshare. That only happens when hearts and lives are changed. That only happens when radical transformation has occurred within someone's soul and someone's spirit. That only happens when the power of the Holy Spirit slowly over time changes and transforms the people of God so that our hearts, our minds, our desires begin to resemble less the ways of violence in this world, the ways of enmity of this world, and more the ways of love and of grace and of the peace of Zion, the reign of God. In the invitation that the prophets, Isaiah and Paul, share with us this day is that it is our call to be about the work of collaborating with God, of following the lead of the Holy Spirit within us to establish Zion here on earth. How do you think nations will no longer learn war? It's such a grand and global vision of peace, right? It's almost too simple, it's almost too easy. I mean, it's easy to say something like, well, let's let nations no longer learn war. Let's let nations turn their spears into plowshares. Because when we use that global language of nations, of largesse, of otherness, we're not talking about ourselves, really, are we? I mean, nations can unlearn war and enmity and violence, but me... Let's leave that at the level of nations. Rivaling countries can unlearn war, but what about rivaling neighbors? What about rivaling church members? What about the conflict that exists in this body, in this sanctuary, the conflicts that exist in our family, the conflicts that exist on our PTA or at work or in our neighborhood? I mean, thank God Isaiah doesn't say anything about neighbors having to work out their differences and no longer learn metaphorical war anymore, right? But it seems like the thing that Isaiah and the thing that Paul are saying is the only way nations will unlearn war and enmity and violence is when the citizens of those nations unlearn war 
and enmity and hatred and jealousy and anger and violence. And the only way that those citizens, which you and I, will unlearn that enmity and hatred and violence is through the messy and real relationships that we find ourselves in. So yes, the invitation, the vision, is this beautific place of peace, globally speaking. But the challenge is for us to live that out in our daily lives. In the most difficult relationships. Zion is coming because God is transforming through the power of the Holy Spirit the people of God so that they might live out that shalom of Zion. But the scriptures are clear. Zion comes when you and I, when the people of God would live accordingly in our families and in our neighborhoods and in our relationships. Globally, the kingdom comes when locally we are transformed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for these, this vision, this Advent vision of hope and this Advent invitation to be people of grace and of love and of mercy. We hope in Zion. And we ask in and through and by the power of your Holy Spirit to live according to Zion. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in singing our